Good morning, El Shaddai Church family and to all of our friends and visitors too. It's good to be together with you in your homes today. We want to tell you about some new things that are happening at ESCC, despite the restrictions on our movements. We're gearing up for Faith Promise Pledge. That's happening on the 30th of August and it's all happening online this year. Check out our website for details on how to pledge online. For those of you who are not familiar with Faith Promise, we put a structure in place once a year which offers you the opportunity to be a financial turnstile with money you do not yet have. How it works is this. Faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you cannot see. So, you ask God to give you an amount that He can trust you with to forward to another who has need of it. The great thing is, it has nothing to do with your budget or your income. You pray, you pledge, and then wait. When God gives you that amount, you forward it to Faith Promise via the normal church account, and 100% of that will be given away anonymously to support those in need. It is a financial adventure and it builds your faith and God's kingdom. No one checks up on you or holds you to it, just God. So if you dare, pray and prepare and let's watch God in action. Lockdown has taken its toll on marriages as many couples have been locked up with each other day in and day out. If you want to dust off stale familiarity, you're welcome to sign up for a meeting that Andre and Jenny will be facilitating. It's on Tuesday, the 1st of September from 8 to 9 p.m. Join us to freshen up your relational intimacy and desire. Details are on our website, including how to register for the meeting. Remember to check our website regularly, especially the events page. We update it on a weekly basis. We also post regularly to our Facebook, Twitter and Instagram accounts. We love you to feel completely connected to us. Now it's time to enjoy some worship with our worship team. Crank up that volume and let's be expectant.
Good morning, Al Shaddai. I hope you guys are well. I'm really excited to share with you this morning in our Nehemiah series on Nehemiah chapter 3. So without any further ado, let's get into it. So when I was uh, preparing for the sermon and reading through Nehemiah 3, I actually got quite concerned. And uh, you will see if you read through Nehemiah with me as we, um, as we talk this morning, um, you'll see that it's actually quite a, in a sense, at first glance, pretty boring. It's a long list of operations and who did what and when and in this whole building project. And I got a little bit concerned as I was preparing because I didn't really have anything profound to share because I wasn't seeing much there. Um, the only thing that really stood out were the very weird names that uh, came up like Meshulam and has and all of these strange things that you could use as a baby name if you are looking. Um, you're just going to have to teach your child how to spell it a number of times. But that aside, I finally, after a while, started digging deeper and eventually I did 
did see this beautiful secret that's hidden in Nehemiah chapter 3 and I want to share it with you this morning. So what it is, is it's actually an incredible blueprint around what God desires and how he's designed kingdom restoration to look like um, for the world. And um, it really answers a difficult problem that we have, this Nehemiah 3 secret, which is this, is that if you look at our country and the brokenness and destruction around us, which it is, it's not being depressing or anything, it's just where we're at as a country, whether you look at it on an economic level or political level, in education, in the family, it seems like there's brokenness everywhere. And it's very easy, I don't know if you're the same as me, when you're looking on the news on your phone, the news is just a swipe away and everything's going wrong. And we can get paralyzed by the sheer volume of work that needs to be done um, to turn this thing around. Now what this Nehemiah chapter 3 story is going to do is it's going to sort that out for us. Instead of asking who's going to do this, how are we going to do this, it's such a big problem, it's overwhelming, I don't know what's going on. Nehemiah chapter 3 speaks, cuts straight through all of the distortion and the white and black noise and all of this stuff and cuts straight in with the truth. And it's this, is that if we want to get this right to um, shift South Africa and restore it, we just have to understand this, is that all in all, you're just another brick in the wall. Now that's a song uh, by Pink Floyd. It's a great song. Listen to it too many times and it gets stuck in your head. But uh, every time you see a face brick wall, I hope you remember this sermon, is that Nehemiah chapter 3 teaches us all in all, we're just another brick in the wall. And that's how we're going to see restoration. Now it might seem confusing and you don't know how that works yet. This all in all, we're another brick in the wall. Just uh, keep track with me throughout the sermon and it'll become clearer. But that's the secret. Okay, let's get into Nehemiah chapter 3 and I'll explain it through. So Nehemiah chapter 3 is very long and it's just a lot of lists about who did what. So I'm not going to read all of it, but I'm going to read verses 6 to 10 just so you have an idea um, what it looked like uh, on a large scale. So we'll read um, starting with verse 6. The Jeshana gate was repaired by Joyada, son of Persia, and Meshulam, son of Besoeda. They laid its beams and put its doors with their bolts and bars in place. Next to them, repairs were made by men from Gibeon and Mizpah, Melatea of Gibeon and Jadon of Merinoth, places under the authority of the government, governor of Trans-Euphrates. Uziel, son of Herhiah, one of the goldsmiths, repaired the next section, and Hananiah, one of the perfume makers, made repairs next to that. They restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Rephiah, son of Hur, ruler of a half district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section. Adjoining this, Jediah, son of Harumaf, made repairs opposite his house. And Hattush, son of Hashabaniah, that's a difficult one, made repairs next to him. So we've made it through that treacherous passage. Let's just get a quickly 35,000 feet perspective on what's actually happening in the story. So we've got this mammoth task. This huge wall needs to be rebuilt and there's a lot of stuff to do. If you're one person, you're never going to get it right. Thankfully, Nehemiah had a team of people and what they did was they assigned specific portions of the wall to each group of people or a number of people and they took responsibility to rebuild it. So you see each person and each group of um, people is assigned responsibility and they play their part, making a contribution. And this massive building project that at first seemed overwhelming and almost impossible to get right became a bite-sized task per person. And this is this beautiful picture. The only problem is while everybody was contributing, we had one little group of people, and this is just something important to remember for the rest of the sermon, that wouldn't get involved. And they are called the Tekoyat noblemen. So we're going to read this in uh, verse 5 of chapter 3. It says, The next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. And Nehemiah is not very impressed with this, and we see it included in chapter 3. So it's important just to remember, we've got a couple of losers that didn't want to get involved because they thought they were fancy and we'll talk about that later but on a large scale on mass everybody's playing a part okay and that's where the flink uh, the flink floyd the pink floyd line comes in all in all you're just another brick in the wall each person who served in this building project knew that they had a part to play and they took ownership therefore a brick in the Jerusalem wall needed to be placed by each of them and each of them showed up to the party and we see this wall that was once almost an, um, an uh, insurmountable task being um, overcome and this task being achieved and that's the great truth to the story in Nehemiah chapter 3. It teaches us this, listen to this carefully, that we are all important to the building plan of God, the rebuilding plan that the king has for our nation and for our world. Without each of us contributing, the building project is hindered 
So if you've been immobilized by fear or disappointment or just being overwhelmed in general, you need to know that you need it in the game. It's time to get in. This kingdom life is a full contact sport, and that's what this, thing is te- uh, this message is teaching us. However, it also keeps us humble at the same time. So while we know it's important to play a role and we're needed, we also understand that we're just part of a bigger picture. And that's part of the joy is that we're part of a family that's on mission. So we've got this beautiful tension between God needs you and without you, this thing isn't going to happen. And at the same time, we're just playing playing a part in the greater story of God. And it's really amazing because that whole principle foreshadows Jesus' New Testament model for the ministry of all believers. So in much of the Old Testament, if you go and read the Old Testament stories, you'll notice that it um, often hinges on one pivotal person's decision, or maybe just two or three people making the right decisions, and then everybody gets saved. And the rest of the people are kind of just peripherals. But in the New Testament, Jesus turns that on his head. He was kind of the last great hero of the biblical story, and he is to this day. But what he did was on the cross, died, resurrected, raised, and then distributed his responsibilities for ministry to the entire body. And that's the age we're living in now. I need you to hear this. God is assigning you a measure of kingdom responsibility, gifting, insight, and favor, and a calling that only you can fulfill so that we can bring redemption to the specific parts of the world to which he has called us. That's what God has got in store for you and me if we choose to respond, if we choose to say, all in all, I'm just another brick in the wall of God's grand kingdom redemption plan. And that's what we need to see. We need to know that we're needed. We need to know that we're wanted. And it's time that each of us understand we've been chosen by God for this. This is not um, some kind of sporadic decision making that God makes where he assigns a random job to somebody because he needs a place filler. You were made for this. You were crafted for this. From the beginning of, your, um, of time, when you were a twinkle in your dad's eye, God made you for this task that he's placed in front of you. So we have to see this. It's time to wake up. In the next 10 years of church life, as we go through all of these difficulties and stuff, a lot will hinge on whether or not the ministry of all believers comes to the front. Because Christ wants a fully functioning body, and he wants a wall without missing bricks. That's you and I. So I want to encourage you, before we get into the application now, if you've been kind of laid back over the past couple of months and lockdowns locked you down, I really want to encourage you, it's time to just wake up a little bit. The Bible says, oh rise, oh sleeper, and Christ's light will shine on you. I want to encourage you now even just to repent in your heart if that was you. Um, and you need to just wake up again and say, Lord, I'm ready to be you, send me. That's where the glory of this life fits in, is just serving God and following Him. So we're going to touch on some application points now, but it's about understanding the importance that God needs you. First point, you want to find your focus. This is how we're going to get this right. Find your focus. What stands out to me about this story is that while the building project was collaborative in nature, each builder was laser focused on the portion of the wall to which they'd been assigned. The story is actually quite deliberate in pointing out how far each person built before handing over to the next person. Each person was focused on a section that had been assigned to them. And we must do the same thing, guys. Getting involved in kingdom exploits and lots of different things and having a broad focus and supporting the general move of God is great. And it's actually part of our calling to having a unity of faith. However, God has also placed you in front of a specific area and piece of broken wall that he wants you to take responsibility over. You need to see that. I'm pointing at you in the camera. You. You need to take responsibility for this kingdom turf that God's placed in front of you. You are a steward. We're kingdom stewards. God has placed you there for a reason. Now, if you want to know how to find that, all you got to do is look where God has placed you. Nehemiah was placed in an area where he was able to go and serve the Jerusalem people. It's about where you're immediately placed. Some of us have callings to go and travel and do all these crazy things. But for the large part of the body, God is not asking you to buy a ticket and uproot your life and leave to America or some other place in the world. God is saying, it's time to look where I've put you here. You were born in South Africa for a reason, whether you are pushing the age of 90 years or you just been born you might not understand English at this point so like 10 years old God has put you here for a reason and your time's not done yet every year of your life is supposed to be uh, spent on this so God has put you here for a reason look around where you were placed and start dreaming with God the other thing you can do is look for a point of intersection with those areas around where you're placed and what breaks your heart God has put within you a portion of his heart his father heart that breaks for the brokenness around us for me in my situation it's around fatherlessness so guys that don't know God loves them as a 
dad or that they've had trouble with their dads in the past as well. And I know that in my heart, my heart breaks for that. And I know it's from God. But for you, it might be something different. For my mom, she hates it when animals are mistreated. Now for me, my heart's not necessarily breaking for that, but hers is just as valid as mine. Why? Because God put it there. The Bible's very clear. The way you treat your animals reflects the character of your heart. So very, just pointing out an as an example, everybody's heartbreak for a, for a specific area of kingdom advancement is from God. Do not allow yourself to lose perspective on that. God has put something in your heart for you to do. So find the point of intersection there and get working in that area. The other thing that you can do, and you've got to do this around finding your focus, is have you ever considered that you, it might be a good idea to bring these areas before God and with the Holy Spirit? Ask the simple question, Holy Spirit, what would it look like for kingdom strategy to be played out in this space through my life and get his perspective on the, on the things you're supposed to be doing. He's the best businessman, the best dad, the best financial advisor. Whatever role you're playing, ask him. You're not going to get it from me or anybody else. Holy Spirit wants to work with you. And there is a safety in the council of all believers, but God is saying, I want to dialogue with you about this. Become a steward and a partner to God in this great kingdom um, operation. So that's really important to do as well. And just understand this as well, is that it's about living incarnationally. God says, here's a number of areas of your life. You're, we're all part of a family. Here's just a, I wrote up a list of, um, traits that one person might have, for example. So maybe you run a business, you're also a member of a family, you also go and get coffee at the same place and the same barista serves you. You walk past the same homeless guy who's begging for food and stuff when you go on your runs and you're in part of a um, book club, okay? Now imagine that's you. God has actually placed you in all of those areas for you to live incarnationally. John 1, um, chapter 1 talks about that. The Word became flesh. So partner with God and say, Holy Spirit, how am I going to become the Word in this place? Find your focus and go for it. So that would be the first point that we can do to really get walking in this. The second thing you want to do is you've got to be a builder and not a noble. Nehemiah chapter 3 verse 5 uh, talks about these noblemen from the Tekoyat clan and they wouldn't stoop down to help the rest of the construction team in the rebuilding project. And they're now forever remembered as real losers because they didn't want to get involved because they thought they were too dignified to get in and uh, get their hands dirty and help. And this is a complete failure and contrast to the New Testament standard, which is this, the greatest among you will be your servant. Jesus set that example when he came down and left his godly status. He didn't lose his divinity. He was fully God when he was down there, but left all of the prestige, all of the comfort, and came down and stooped down to earth to play the role of a servant for us, the suffering servant, the Messiah. He's setting the example for us. And if there's anything in your life or in my life that is hindering us from serving deeply and getting our hands dirty and living this life for God and the kingdom, not for anything else, not for our comfort or success or personal prestige or acclaim, anything that's getting in the way of that service and that heart of servanthood, we need to get rid of it because it's an idol. And it's time to abandon things like that that are holding us back, whether it's title or wealth or stinking thinking or fear, get rid of it. It's not, for the, um, it's not worthy of a Christian to walk that way. We're called to walk like Jesus. So get in there and serve. And another thing on service is it's the best way to get influence. If you're looking to get involved and help in the world systems out there and make and um, bring the kingdom in there and like leaven spread throughout the loaf, the best way to do that is to serve. People always want somebody to serve. And as believers, we carry John 10, 10 life within us. So we carry that innate, that leaven from the, from the parable about spreading out into the world. So go in and serve. Don't be a nobleman, be a builder. And then the third thing you want to do is you want to pass it on. And this is really important for the sake of a generational movement of believers. You've got to ask yourself the question, who am I teaching about wall building? It's futile, guys, to go about building a wall without ensuring that we are reproducing the same burden in the hearts of others. Nehemiah and his team, if you go and read the rest of Nehemiah, you'll find that it's kind of an anticlimax because um, Nehemiah and Zerubbabel and Ezra didn't really get everything right in terms of transferring the burden to the people that they were leading and the subsequent um, uh, generation. And what happened was they actually had to come back again um, and do a lot of, well not back as in location back, but back to the people and put in a lot of reforms because they didn't transfer a burden to the people that this is our wall, this is our city, this is our kingdom. And guys, this is a basic call to discipleship. If, we're, if you're not discipling somebody yet, it's time to do that. There are people in your area of expertise and influence and calling and life that need you to teach them about the burden of the kingdom and following after God. So find that person. You don't have to, again, go looking miles and miles away. They're in your space right now, and God will make the way for you. Just pray for him to connect you to the right people and take them out for coffee and start touching their life. 
And if, the, if you're in business, find a business guy. It works like that. It's really helpful because we need to transfer the same values that way. Otherwise, the wall, once it's built, will fall apart again in the next generation. So we've got to get this generational Jesus picture of discipleship and movement into our heart. So find people to teach about wall building. Okay, guys, in summary, let's just look at this again. Nehemiah 3 gives us a beautiful picture of what it's like to play a part in God's kingdom plan of redemption. And it's that bottom line again. All in all, you're just another brick in the wall. It's a privileged position. You are an important part of this. We all are. And this is the grand privilege that Jesus, the chief cornerstone, invites you and I to play a role as co-laboring and friends to the king in this beautiful plan to see South Africa, our nation, and the world come to the light of our rising and to the glory of the king. So I want to leave you with one final challenge in this is sometime in this week, go read Nehemiah 3 from the perspective of this is an operational plan revealing the blueprint principle around everybody finding something to do in this life and selling their heart for it and going after Jesus and surrendering in that and say to God in that, Lord, what are you calling me to do and how am I going to do it? When you've done that, the last thing you've got to do is surrender. 2020 has been a year for me of learning what it really means to surrender. And Matthew 6.33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Remember that the emphasis is not all these things. The emphasis is seek first the kingdom. And I want to say this prophetically is if we get that right, the reason South Africa will become a redeemed nation will be because normal people gave their lives, gave their lives, not gave their time, not gave their money, not gave their um, expertise or their opinion or their verbal support, gave their life, okay, to see the broken walls in front of them restored. That's what this takes. The kingdom is calling for your life. And these guys from Nehemiah 3, all the men that rebuilt, who we would, uh, in my first reading of Nehemiah 3, I skimmed over all of them, but they're the reason the wall was built. So Jesus, without, uh, um, without Jesus, we can't do anything. But without us, Jesus won't do anything. That's how he structured this thing. He is sovereign, but he's looking for partnership. So this is the last time I'm going to use the Pink Floyd line. And I hope you go and listen to the song when you walk around Durbanville and go and think this through. All in all, you're just another brick in the wall. And God's calling you to rise up and take your place. Let's quickly pray. Father, I just come before you and I just thank you that um, you sent your son to play his part in um, rebuilding this wall, this kingdom wall, which is not a physical wall, but it's a family on mission, a kingdom family on mission, the church. And he played the role as the chief cornerstone. So Jesus, I just humbly come before you now um, with this El Shaddai family. And we just say like, we just want to follow your example. We want to walk like you walked. So Jesus, I just pray that you would set into our heart this conviction that we would pick up our cross and deny ourselves and follow you and be somebody who just plays their role in the wall. Understanding that their, um, their joy will be most fulfilled when they are walking with you in partnership, seeing the world restored. So Lord, I pray for all of that. I just pray for innovative ideas and relationships and just favor to rest on the people that are willing to take this and run with it. That we might see South Africa in the next 10 years not be a failed state, not be um, a corrupt nation. None of those things where there's brokenness everywhere, but we start seeing restoration happen. And we declare that prophetically over our nation and over this church. In Jesus' name, amen.
Freedom, awaken.